You know and love him for his green pajamas and doofy helmets, but Kang has a lot more than that hanging in his wardrobe. I mean, you and your variants would be fashion forward too if you time traveled as much as the Kangs do, but don't worry, all of them are as deadly as they are stylish. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at some of Kang's most powerful suits, hmm? They say you never forget your first, and even for a time-traveling maniac like Kang, I'm sure that applies to his many supervillain identities as well. Before we had the big blue badass we know today, Nathaniel Richards initially took to supervillainy by traveling back to ancient Egypt in a sphinx-shaped time machine. Here he used his fancy future tech to enslave the people and establish himself as the mad pharaoh, Ramatut, which ticked off the Egyptian god of vengeance, Khonshu, and eventually resulted in a massive butt kicking from the Fantastic Four, Doctor Strange, and the West Coast Avengers. Ouch. And if you think dressing up like you're trying to film another ill-fated reboot of The Mummy is a bit nuts for a time-traveling supervillain to do, then hold on to your scarabs. It gets weirder from here. Now, the Rama Tut identity is really just Nathaniel wearing a pharaoh getup, but still, enslaving all of Egypt, while temporarily blind, no less, is no small feat. And we do need to give some credit to Kang's first big villainous outing, although his biggest achievement as Ramatut was probably mentoring N. Saba Nur, who would later become better known as Mutant Menace Apocalypse. Yeah, that, that, that worked out real well for everyone. Not one to be discouraged by a little bit of dethroning, Nathaniel's next stint as a supervillain came when he fled Egypt and ended up in the then modern day Marvel Universe. Here he was inspired by Doctor Doom to come up with a new look for himself and became the Scarlet Centurion. Deciding to stir up trouble once more, the Scarlet Centurion went back to the earliest days of the Avengers and convinced the founding members that in the future, the growing population of superheroes would lead to a massive of world wars and convinced them to fight against the modern day Avengers. Okay, the fact that he had a literal will sapping ultra diode ray probably did some of the talking for him to be honest. Oh, oh, and uh, speaking of will sapping diode rays, let me just uh, find mine real quick. Okay, uh, you are now under my command and you will like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos if you know what is good for the time stream. All right, that should do it. Anyways, set Sadly for Nathaniel, the Scarlet Centurion debacle was a colossal failure, and he since abandoned that whole thing entirely, except for a divergent version of the Centurion, who instead went on to become a regular foe of the Squadron Supreme. Don't give up on your dreams, kids. Some folks don't really come into their own until late in their lives, and Amortis is a prime example. After growing bored of being a conqueror and briefly giving that whole ruler of Egypt thing another go, this version of Nathaniel eventually went to limbo in order to further study the finer points of time itself, hoping to achieve immortality. That's when the timekeepers stuck their big old noses in things and made him a deal. They'd give him immortality as long as he spends the next 80,000 years as a custodian of time, going from timeline to timeline, cleaning up his own messes. Of course, this still puts him at odds with the Avengers quite often, especially when he's going around killing Nexus beings, such as one Wanda Maximoff. So he's basically Kang, but much older, immortal, and convinced he's doing a practical job that needs to be done. Yeah, Immortus is no joke, even if he does wear what looks like a giant salt shaker on his head. Do you think the kid version of yourself would like you if they met you now? Kang sure didn't. When Kang went back in time to save his younger self from some bullies and show him his future as a powerful supervillain, he actually freaked out his past self so badly that he immediately bailed to the past, stole some old vision parts, built himself an Iron Man suit, gathered a whole team of young Avengers, and christened himself Iron Lad, all just to beat the crap out of his older self and vow to never become like him. Today's episode of CBR was brought to you by the letter B for backfire. One of the ways Iron Lad's armor differs from Iron Man's is not just with his ability to time travel, but the fact that his armor is controlled with a neurokinetic interface, meaning it responds directly to his thoughts and can be operated independently of himself. Yeah, Tony can technically do the same, but it does require some kind of control input. Not so much with Iron Lad. As for not becoming like his future self, well...
Say hello to Kid Amortis. And yeah, things are getting weird now. See, Iron Lad's time as a hero didn't really go as planned and eventually led to the death of Scott's daughter, Cassie Lang, known at the time as the size-changing superheroine, Stature. Racked with grief by this, Iron Lad decided to embrace his villainous destiny, but also to one-up all his other variants by skipping all the Pharaoh and Centurion nonsense and going straight to calling himself Amortis. Don't know why he thought adding Kid to that or making himself look even more like the vision would make him seem more menacing, but hey, to each their own. One of the really fun things about Kid Amortis, as opposed to many other versions of Kang, is that, well, he's not really very good at the whole supervillain thing. Oh sure, he has big plans and talks a big game, but once he actually gets the pieces together, it all crumbles faster than you can say Kang Dynasty. How so, you ask? Well, you'll just have to stick around to find out. Oh hey, he's wearing an actual suit this time. How's that for a literal interpretation of the video title? Yeah, by now you've gathered that Kang is no stranger to getting stuck in random timelines, but he does always seem to be able to find a way to make the most of it. This version of Kang was booted into the early 21st century by a glitch in the time stream that he couldn't escape. And rather than sit and mope about it, he simply decided to go about conquering in a different way by renaming himself Mr. Griffin. No, not that one. And becoming CEO of a shady company called Quang Enterprises, just when he thought Kang couldn't possibly get any scummier. One cool thing about Mr. Griffin is that he, or at least his company, is actually confirmed to exist within the MCU multiverse, considering it made an appearance back in Loki Episode 5. Makes you wonder if there are any Scarlet Centurions or Rama Tuts running around in there somewhere too. Though Mr. Griffin was hardly the first time Kang dressed up for the business world, no, that honor goes to his Mr. Timely persona. After a particularly devastating butt-kicking from the Avengers, Kang decided to play the long game. He did this by going back to the town of Timely, Wisconsin on January 1st, 1901, taking on the name Victor Timely and establishing a tech and robotics company called Timely Industries, from which he used his self-made chronopolis to keep track of his time con quests between business meetings. The interesting part happens in 1929 when, posing as his own descendant, Victor Timely Jr., he hired a new robotics expert named Phineas Horton to work for his company. Then, in 1939, Phineas built the original Human Torch, better known as Marvel Comics' very first superhero. And what was Marvel called back then? Timely Comics. Yep, it all checks out. So in a very roundabout way, Kang is the one who started the entire modern world heroic age in Marvel. Congratulations, you played yourself. Now, traditionally, and in all our entries so far, Kang has always been some variation of Nathaniel Richards, a possible descendant of Reed Richards, or Doctor Doom, depending on who you ask. But this isn't true of every version of Kang, particularly not the one found in the Ultimate line of Marvel Comics, who shook things up by being a variant of none other than Susan Storm. Sent back in time by her version of Reed in an attempt to prevent a disaster from wiping out the universe, she did so by attempting to gather the Infinity Gems and essentially taking over the world with the help of the Maker, who was himself an evil alternate version of Reed Richards. Unfortunately, her idea of saving the world also included killing Quicksilver and attempting to erase the entire mutant gene from humanity, so naturally the heroes had to stop her. But yep, here we have a Kang who, on top of all the tech and other usual powers, has Sue's invisibility and can generate invisible force fields and other constructs. Susan is not the only female king either, at least not once we get into the sheer wackiness that is Warp World. In an attempt to save Soul World, a whole dimension existing within the Soul Gem, Gamora of Guardians of the Galaxy fame gathered the rest of the Infinity Stones and essentially ended up folding the entire universe in on itself. This resulted in every two souls in the universe being fused together and creating a whole new person out of their parts. And one of the most unlikely of these fusions came by fusing Kang with the teenage superhero Miss Marvel, thus giving us the hilariously named Kamala Kang. So yeah, the comics actually have a version of Kang that is not only a much younger girl, but also has the abilities to embiggen herself. Although in her case, she can do so across time and space much further than Kamala Kang. Uh, uh, further than Kamala Khan. I mean, uh, further than Kamala Khan. Yeah, that one. 
Now that we're talking about fused universes, what about that time Marvel and DC got smushed together? Yeah, back in the 90s, the two companies finally decided to duke it out in a massive crossover, though in an unexpected move, it led to the temporary creation of the Amalgam universe, where the characters from both companies got fused into entirely new entities, creating a whole comic book line of wild and interesting matchups. This time, Kang got mixed up with the Time Trapper, a somewhat obscure villain of the Legion of Superheroes who had the ability to manipulate time more directly without the need of Kang's tech and weaponry. Calling himself Kronos Tut, he went up against Spider-Boy, a fusion of the Ben Riley version of Spider-Man, and the Superman clone, Connor Kent, in an attempt to gain access to all realities and timelines at once by forcefully tearing the two back apart. Yeah, the Amalgam universe was wild and oh so damn cool. Can we get that back, pretty please? Remember the whole young Nathaniel makes Iron Lad becomes Kid Amortis thing from earlier? Well, when Kid Amortis was mulling around planning out how to be the best villain he could be, he was approached by a young version of Ravona Renslayer, another time traveler with tons of variants who tends to end up involved with Kang in some way. This Renslayer told him of a future where he merged together with the two other big time villains Annihilus and Doctor Doom and formed a being called Doom the Annihilating Conqueror, who then managed to kill all members of the Fantastic Four in his timeline, all save for Johnny Storm, who went back in time to warn everybody. And then Kid Amortis, ever eager to one-up his counterparts, was like, that sounds awesome, and tried to make it happen way sooner, only for Doom to refuse the merger, absorb Kid Amortis's power for himself, and then immediately get his head kicked in by Scott Lang. But still, Kang's tech, Doom's magic, and Annihilus's uh, space insectness all rolled into one baddie? Yeah, I gotta say, that's kind of terrifying. But not nearly as terrifying as our final entry, Kang the Time Eater. Okay, we all agree that Kang is pretty powerful, right? And that many of these variants are even more powerful? Well, take a moment to try and imagine what happens when a guy who conquers timelines for sport decides to absorb the power of Galactus, the Great Devourer. I'll tell you what happens. What happens is he becomes Kang the Time Eater and begins traveling between timelines and realities to kill and absorb the powers of any version of Galactus he can find, eventually turning him into a creature capable of literally eating entire universes. Naturally, something like this falls in the hands of the Exiles, a team of heroes gathered from several endangered realities to fix. A team consisting of Exiles veteran Blink from the Age of Apocalypse, a grizzled bad future version of Kamala Khan, a higher ranked version of Valkyrie, a cartoonish baby version of Wolverine, and none other than Iron Lad himself. That kid just cannot catch a break on the whole meeting horrific versions of himself front, can he? Well, now that we all have a big ol' headache from trying to keep track of all these Kang variants, it's time to just lean back, wait for Quantumania, and fill out our bingo cards on how many of these are going to appear or be alluded to in that movie. Whoever gets a full plate first wins a fancy Kang chair! 